Yo, what up? This is Josh Rubin from East West Alien Performance. Today, today I'm actually a little tired. Honestly, a little tired. I've had an interesting week. I got a new iMac. I'm pretty excited about that. Just transferring all my data, trying to fit that in with working with clients, with the little glips that I had going on with the iMac and transferring the information. But it's all good. I want to get a YouTube out, and I'm going to go off the cuff. I usually go off the cuff. Sometimes I have some notes, of course. Um, but what I want to talk about is this. Supplementation. I don't even know what I want to call this video. All I know is that for some reason everyone wants to take supplements. I have some clients that are doing so well with nutrition. They're logging their foods. They're looking at their ratios. They're looking at their grams. They're able to get off their medications, get off their hormones. They're able to wake up and have energy and get out of bed. Their depression's going away. Their PMS is going away. On and on and on. And they say to me, hey, I'd love to take a supplement. Everyone's taking supplements. I say on this form, or I see on this form, on this Facebook, everyone's taking this supplement. I should take it. There's a lot of forums out there. Every day there's a new blogger, there's a new forum, there's a new website, there's a new Facebook page, or on repeat. It's honestly, I, I think it's great, but it, it's just out of control. There's just a new one every, every day, and the problem is it's confusing people. And I'm not saying that, that they don't support people, of course, but there's lay people on there, and there's not practitioners, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but everyone's just sharing their own information. So I think my point is you have to keep in mind it's not individualized. And we have to really look at what's going on with you, what's going on with your life. And that's another key point. <clears throat> I think people forget that even though we're talking about nutrition, even though we recommend nutrition, there's so many other pieces to the healing puzzle that everyone forgets about. There's life, there's stressors, there's, there's you have children, you work out. So nutrition is one piece of the puzzle, and then you have all these other pieces that everyone forgets about. I have some clients, they'll be doing great, logging their temps, everything, and then midday their pulse goes to 90. And we can't figure it out. We look at nutrition, we try to regulate it, we look at adrenaline, we look at salt, we look at cortisol, we use foods, sugars, etc. And nothing helps. And then they say, well, what do you do midday? Well, midday is typically when my kids get home, my husband gets home, i got to get snacks ready, yada, yada, yada. So they forget about themselves. They're giving all their energy away to help other people for two hours, and they're stressing out. So that's a life piece of the puzzle that they're not focusing on, and nutrition can modulate stress to only some degree. If you're staying up all night because you're working the graveyard shift, nutrition is only going to modulate stress for so long, or only to a certain extent. So you have to remember that and think about these things. So my point to do in this video is to talk about progesterone and testosterone. Now, I don't want to get too technical to, on it, which I always say that and I do, but I just find that for some reason everyone wants to take progesterone or everyone wants to take maybe, uh, uh, as they get older, um, a uh, transdermal um, like gel for testosterone um, or take injectable low doses testosterone. We have to really look at what's going on. Yes, as you age, because of stressors, altered lifestyle, nutrition, these things naturally decrease, especially progesterone. But the question is, does it naturally decrease because of age, or is it decrease because aging is actually a stress because of what you're putting in your body or not putting on your body? What's happening at the cellular level? You have excess iron absorption because of excess estrogen. It creates the environment for iron to actually flourish. It's because you have a copper deficiency that's allowing iron to actually become excess in the body. It's the body's inability to detox estrogen and endotoxin. Is it a diet high in unsaturated fats that's affecting cellular respiration? That's hyperstimulating the beta cells of the pancreas, causing hyperinsulinemia. There's many factors that can cause these low levels. So if we look at progesterone first, and we think about, well, according to many people, you get T3, now, of course, light, magnesium, all these things play into it. But you have cholesterol, T3, and vitamin A. And according to Ray Pete, if vitamin A is a pre precursor to progesterone, we can conclude that vitamin A is antiestrogenic. Now, I'm not saying go take vitamin A. I'm saying utilize foods that have vitamin A. And vitamin E has been shown to ac actually increase the absorption and efficiency of the use of vitamin A in the body. You can get vitamin E from many of the foods that you eat. This is why Ray Pete actually puts vitamin E in his progesterone progest E. At the same time, vitamin E is anti-estrogenic, it's anti-inflammatory, it's antiviral, but it, it's antagonistic to estrogen because estrogen pulls oxygen and nutrients away from the tissues, away from your cells, where vitamin E actually pushes it towards the cells and towards um, your organs. 
I don't remember the exact study. It was actually in our newest blog that we wrote. If you go to our website, go to the blog. Um, I think it was called Aging, Puberty, and Infertility. It was a study done on hamsters by Soderwall. And he showed that in aging hamsters, of course, they were infertile. I can't remember the exact study. But providing them with adequate amounts of vitamin E actually um, created an environment within the organs of the female for the embryo to actually implant because there was adequate oxygen. Estrogen pulls the oxygen away. So at that 8th to 10th week, when the embryo wants to implant itself, it needs oxygen to do that. It needs life. If it doesn't, because of estrogen, there's no oxygen left available, and that's when most people have a miscarriage, because it can't implant. Now, my point is this. Vitamin A, T3, from the foods we eat, eliminating unsaturated fats, eating digestible foods, Getting the right amount of carbohydrates, everyone's afraid of carbohydrates. If you understand physiology, you shouldn't be afraid of the right types of carbohydrates. The bottom line is if you eat them and you eliminate unsaturated fats, you can upregulate cell energy production, T3. T4 converts to T3 in the liver. It needs glucose and selenium. You can get this from a lot of tropical fruits, root vegetables, sugars, honey, um, at the same time eliminating unsaturated fats because that inhibits the conversion. Down-regulating cortisol because that inhibits the conversion. Down-regulating estrogen, it's reabsorption because that inhibits the conversion. So if we upregulate T3, we use cholesterol efficiently and we produce, of course, pregnenolone progesterone. So if our progesterone levels are low, what's the problem? And it's common. A lot of people say I'm estrogen dominant. Well, the question is, you know, it's really hard to be deficiency in estrogen because estrogen is, as you age, especially in men, is produced and stored in fat cells and in the adrenal glands. So the question is, are you not detoxifying estrogen and reabsorbing it? Are you not regulating your blood sugar, which is increasing estrogen because it, it wastes glucose? Are you taking the birth control pills or something exogenous that's increasing estrogen in the body? Is the body overstressed? That's down-regulating progesterone and pregnenolone because you're over-synthesizing it. When you're stressed, the body's thinking about safety and security. That's our survival order. Safety, security first, then sustenance, then sex or procreation. That's how reptilians live. That's their brain. That's our autonomic nervous system. So once the body has safety and security, then it only then thinks about sustenance. Think about this. You're running from a lion in a sense. You're stressed. You're not thinking about taking a shit. You're not thinking about eating food. You're thinking about running from a lion. And you're not thinking about procreating. So in a sense, all hormones are diverted away from that. And pregnenolone especially, and these other things I talked about, even progesterone is kind of diverted from the sexual pathways and digestion and towards overproducing cortisol. Because the body wants to fight inflammation, regulate blood sugar, regulate blood pressure. That's what it does in a normal state, per se. But we should come out of that. It's just like Hanselia's general adaptation syndrome, stage one, two, three. Alarm, um, I think it's alarm, resistance, and exhaustion. I forget the exact names. And if you look at the alarm phase, it's like high cortisol levels. That's stage one. This is where I think people actually misinterpret it as work. If you're in an alarm phase and you're in stage one, per se, you have high cortisol levels, it could be because you're chronically stressed, you're eating a diet high in unsaturated fats, you're not regulating your blood sugar, you're not eating a diet that is uh, including that doesn't include the right types of carbohydrates. So the body breaks itself down to increase blood sugar, which is going to increase cortisol levels. Unsaturated fats and estrogen actually do that. And if you stress, your cortisol levels are going to go up. So how could you be in a stage one? It's the body's normal adaptation to stress, general adaptation syndrome. We should be able to come back down to that. If not, we overutilize cholesterol. We oversynthesize if we're producing it, T3, pregnenolone, um, vitamin A etc. We can end up with lower levels of progesterone in this. At the same time, and this goes with two testosterone as well, the same exact thing is happening with testosterone because it has a lot of the same precursors. So it can be low for the same reasons. At the same time, if we don't come out of this stage and we keep leading our life and we don't pay attention to it, the signs are always there. Your body has a radio station. Tune into it. Tune into what's going on in your life. If you don't tune into it, you go into that second phase stage two adrenal fatigue, or Hanselier's second stage of the general adaptation syndrome. I'm drawing a blank right now. I think it's the uh, resistance phase, or it's the second phase. This is when you're kind of peaking. 
you've been in, you know, your the first phase, the alarm phase for a while, and you're not paying attention to your stresses, you start overutilizing a lot of these resources, and you peak, or a lot of these, the, the cortisol and progesterone and everything, start to actually become slightly deficient or normal. It's almost like they're excess, you're overutilizing things, you look at a graph, and then you test in your stage two, per se, things are starting to come back down. That's why you can actually somewhat look normal on a lab or actually have some highs and lows because of what's going on. We have to look at this. What's going on in their life? What are they not doing? A lot of the times it's because they're not eating the right types of foods, frequencies, grams, ratios, percents, etc. They're not regulating how the cells are actually using glucose. There's a lot of things in the body like estrogen, unsaturated fats, endotoxin, from eating the wrong foods, etc. that can create this. Then over time, if we still ignore this, of course, we're going to end up low. The low cortisol stage three, this is the exhaustion phase of the general adaptation syndrome. I think people completely misinterpreted his work, and now they name it stage three exhaustion, adrenal fatigue exhaustion. You would die if you stub your toe, you would die if you were in adrenal exhaustion. At the same time, going back to stage one, estrogen has actually been shown to not only hyperstimulate cortisol secretion, but actually growth of the adrenal gland. So that can actually push you in a stage one, per se, excess estrogen or reabsorbing it, or unopposed estrogen from low progesterone, from being stressed. So the stage three, it's almost like your cholesterol, vitamin A, T3, deficient. You've used up all your resources because you've been pushing the pedal to the metal for so long. This is why you have low cortisol. So... I guess that was a huge tangent, but going back to it, this is how you end up with low progesterone. This is how you end up with low testosterone because the body's constantly stressed from not living a, a healthy lifestyle, not paying attention to your body, not eating the right foods, eating foods that affect cellular respiration that lead you down this path, not eating digestible foods like above-ground vegetables that are loaded with cellulose that lead to excess endotoxin production that not only inhibit detoxification in the liver, but increase estrogen in the body, which affects cellular respiration, affects T4 to T3 conversion, waste glucose, waste B6, which stimulates prolactin, which, break down, which breaks down bone, and waste sodium. So it's just a cascade of effects. So the bottom line is this. If you have low progesterone, think about it. Are the precursors there? Am I eating the right foods? And if they're not, maybe I'm wasting them because I'm living in a chronic stress state. Do I need progesterone? No. Or testosterone? That's at the bottom of the barrel there. I have to look at, am I eating foods that are high in cholesterol? Shellfish and eggs. Quality, of course. Am I eating them the right frequency and ratios per my body type with carbohydrates? Am I eating the right types of digestible carbohydrates, like root vegetables? Am I eating the right types of carbohydrates that facilitate cellular respiration, like tropical fruits, ripe and tropical fruits, and cooking even some of these tropical fruits? Am I getting carbs, proteins, fats with every meal? Am I logging them to look at if it's working and not working based on how I feel, temperatures, and pulses? Am I getting enough calories to actually meet my energy needs because I'm trying to heal? If not, you're going to end up with low progesterone levels. It doesn't mean you need to take progesterone. It doesn't mean you need to take testosterone. Now, I'm not saying that sometimes it's needed. I'm not saying that sometimes it can actually be quite beneficial. But only when someone's actually regulated their blood sugar, their temps and pulses, put 100% effort into the nutrition, logging frequencies, grams, percents. Typically, it takes clients anywhere from three to six months to do this. If from doing that, we keep hitting some small roadblocks, we made some progress, but we've created a physiological foundation, then we can think about adding in pregnenolone. Then we can think about adding in progesterone. We don't recommend taking testosterone, but hopefully we can upregulate it from upregulating nutrition. And if it's needed, then we'll add it in. I'm saying this because I see too many people adding in pregnenolone and even progesterone, A, in the wrong type, but B, at the wrong time when they don't need it. And the problem is, if you're estrogen dominant and your progesterone level is normal, progesterone is going to do nothing to help you. You have to use food to prevent its reabsorption. You have to use food to help with detoxification. You have to eliminate foods that overburn the liver that affect detoxification. You have to use foods that are going to regulate blood sugar to downregulate estrogen absorption and um, excess um, production of it. You have to work on your foods to, you know, kind of lose weight to decrease the number of fat cells that are producing it. You have to reduce your stress levels. You have to look at your excess, you know, exogenous stresses in your life. Are you taking the birth control pill? Because if you're reabsorbing it, excess progesterone is not going to help. And I'm saying this because I've seen, I would say, a lot of people that email us, and even clients that take it without even talking to us about it, that take it when they don't need it, or take these things at the wrong time. All I can say is it creates hormonal havoc. It causes missed periods. It causes spotting. 
It causes increased clotting, etc. Now, I'm not saying it's bad. It's, it's the body unwinding, but it's unwinding without a physiological foundation. And, you know, everything has its purpose in the body. You know, I'm not saying that too much progesterone can kill you, but too much of anything can have a negative impact on the body. And if you're taking it, you don't need it, it can have more of a negative impact. So think about this. I don't even know what to call this video. I don't even know what I'm talking about. I'm all over the place, but hopefully you get my point. Think about nutrition first. If you're confused, watch our YouTubes, go to our blog. Work with someone, work with us to work on your nutrition. The types of foods, the food frequency, the grams of carbs, proteins, fats at every meal, the percents, looking at your calories, and using body temperature balls to regulate them. Then decide, after three to six months, or more, if progesterone is actually needed. I would say nine times out of ten, honestly, it's not. If I'm working with people with PCOS, endometriosis, they have infertility, um, they're in menopause, early menopause, then I'll think about using it. But most of my clients, we try not to. We really try to use food first because if the body doesn't have a physiological foundation to work from, what we've seen is that the progesterone, the pregnenolone, etc., can actually have a negative impact on your health because the body doesn't need it. So hopefully you've enjoyed this YouTube clip. My rambling. I'm out of here.